Thank you so much, Rita, for that really warm uh, and generous introduction. And thank you so much to the entire awards committee for acknowledging my work in this way and the work of my students and, and postdocs. Um, yeah, so today, as Rita said, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about cells in space and some methods we've developed for spatial genomics. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so imaging cells and, and looking at uh, collections of cells um, in, in vivo or, or on, a, on a dish, on a petri dish, uh, has been around for a long time. We've been doing this for quite a while. Um, so in some sense, there are a bunch of old goals that exist for existing technologies. Um, uh, so for example, one thing we might want to do is to take imaging data like these a &E stains from GTEx or this uh, fluorescence imaging uh, uh, from Jared Tocher's lab that we have and featureize them, uh, be able to identify where the cells are maybe, uh, talk about uh, the size and shape of cells or uh, how large the cells are and talk about heterogeneity as well. Uh, we also want to normalize and quantify uh, uh, features uh, in this space. Uh, we also want to control for confounders, which is incredibly hard to do in image features. Uh, we would like to align and register uh, across the different samples. Uh, this is incredibly important when we're looking at population-wide variation, and it's also very hard to do with sampling with, with imaging data. Uh, one thing that my group is particularly interested in, but others have uh, definitely uh, done huge amounts of work in, is uh, multimodal data integration across different technologies and, and, and different data modalities. Um, and then cell segmentation and dense labeling is one of the hardest tasks simply because we often need uh, cell segmentation before we can apply a lot of these machine learning methods to these data sets. Um, we have new emerging technologies though that sort of require us to think about new goals uh, for this new space. Uh, there's so much to think about here. So this is actually a picture uh, from uh, some Seekfish uh, Plus data from Long Kai's uh, lab at Caltech. Um, so with these new technologies, we might want to uh, do, for example, tell cell type or cell state labeling, as you can see uh, over here in this column. Uh, we might want to consider a common coordinate system, basically mapping uh, these different images to the same set of coordinates. Um, we might want to think about how to do imputation. So a lot of these uh, single cell spatial uh, genomics methods uh, only assay a handful of markers where we want to actually get the full uh, composition of markers or maybe no markers at all, actually. Um, we would like to try uh, to find spatially aware dimension reduction methods so we can understand what, vari what variation exists uh, in the population uh, in a spatially aware way. Uh, we'd like to quantify local variation in expression uh, simply because it turns out that a cell's environment really influences what goes on in a cell. Uh, so it's incredibly exciting to have the technologies now to do that. Uh, we'd like to understand the impact of local environment on cell state, uh, how cells interact, how they signal to each other, um, how, they, how they change uh, based on where they are. Um, we'd like to also predict the effects of perturbations uh, and interventions on these different cell types. And we think about, um, uh, for example, uh, exposing these uh, cells to a particular drug or medication, uh, or if we do CRISPR knockdowns, uh, for example, uh, these perturbations, we'd like to know the effects of them. We'd like to be able to predict the effects of them uh, on, on the cells, on the spatial uh, cells, the, the state of these cells in space. Uh, and finally, I think we are really interested in thinking about uh, the spatial or the cell type effects of quantitative trait loci. This is uh, my background in, in GTEx and thinking about cis and trans EQTLs uh, inspires uh, those ideas. So there are a ton of analytic challenges and I sort of came up with two that I, I consider uh, sort of the biggest, um, the biggest issues going into these types of data analyses. So first of all, I think access to cellular variation now uh, is both a blessing and a curse, right? So we have um, now single cell data. Uh, we have a huge amount of variation within a sample, whereas before with bulk RNA sequencing and bulk attack seq and everything else, we were just getting averages. We were getting means across very heterogeneous sets of cells. Um, so the cellular variation is, is wonderful um, because we get to really understand neighborhoods of cells now, but it's also a curse in the sense that now we have to sort of uh, expand from matrices uh, in understanding our samples to tensors where we now have an additional access of variation to, uh, to contend with uh, in all, all of our analyses. 
So for example, some questions that come up in my mind um, are how to study local or, or popula uh, population wide uh, spatial variation and how to control for effects of confounders on variation. We might also want to uh, look at um, axes, uh, these additional axes uh, to explore in variation. So when we can now consider variation due to genetics or local context or sample demographics like age and race and sex, um, if we consider experimental design, we all have to include in, in each of these analyses now this additional access of variation, which is single cells in this space. Um, we might also want to consider deconvolving patterns from each of these sources. Um, that's a, a part of my talk today. Another, uh, another analytic challenge that I consider um, incredibly challenging going into this is uh, current methods are really not suited to the design of experiments. Um, so we often see case control experiments. Uh, we often see time series experiments and thinking about sort of naive um, uh, dimension reduction methods like PCA or a non-negative matrix factorization. We'd really like to control specifically for these uh, experimental designs for the time series for the case control experiments. Um, we'd also like to think about uh, these large scale CRISPR perturbations, for example, or other types of uh, large scale perturbation experiments or exposure experiments. Um, how can we do that, for example, um, in, in network design? How can we account uh, in the networks that we create for contextual associations where really one cell only affects another in a particular context, for example? Um, so I think given these challenges, a, a lot of the analytic methods that we have sitting around um, for our bulk RNA sequencing um, and, and bulk attack and everything else that we have for bulk data need to be rethought in this new framework. The older methods really miss a lot of the complex signals and oversimplify the data and the patterns uh, that we see. And uh, we, need to, we need to go a little bit deeper now. So, um, so I have put together a talk uh, that describes three different examples. Um, so the first example uh, from my work is uh, image CCA image. Um, well, I, well, I'll explain it all in a second. Uh, that combines uh, high dimensional expression data with paired histology data. This is uh, actually fairly old work. Uh, I'll explain the pathway to get there as well. Um, but I sort of have the uh, past work, present work, future work all outlined uh, here. Uh, example two is going to be uh, a cellular point process to deconvolve cell signaling and spatiotemporal data. And the third example is going to be non-negative process factorization that identifies spatial patterns uh, and spatial sequencing data. And I should say going into this that the research objective that I have uh, thinking about these uh, single cell data sets are to build statistical models and machine learning based models that may be used to discover patterns, uh, to create testable hypotheses, and to identify mechanisms in genomic data. And so I'm going to show you a handful of examples, like I said, that sort of go through uh, these ideas. So um, histological images have been around for a very long time. And I would argue that a picture is worth sort of a, a thousand features, give or take. Um, and so here are some images from the GTEx uh, consortium data set of different tissues that they had. They specifically got, um, uh, took uh, these uh, histological images for every single sample of hard uh, tissues that they sequenced uh, simply because they wanted to sequence only healthy tissues. And so healthy but dead tissues. Um, uh, so these are examples of some healthy tissues across the different spectrum of, of tissues that we have in GTEx. Um, but as I said, histological images have been around forever. Um, they're absolutely critical in a lot of medical diagnostics, like cancer diagnosis often relies on uh, histological images or uh, pathology images, um, at least stained images. Um, features from these images are associated with genotype, you know, gene expression, uh, different um, cell types and also tissue organization. So the idea is that we would like to, oops, code, encode variation uh, from the features in these images that correlate with uh, some of these different covariates that we're interested in. Uh, so the way that we did this, first of all, uh, we need to build uh, some type of approach to featureize each of these uh, uh, histological images. Um, so in practice, um, we found that annual manual annotation of these uh, pathology images was infeasible. Uh, we have one pathologist on this and tens of thousands of images, so we couldn't have him uh, marking up each of these images by hand. Uh, but also the available image segmentation methods for these, uh, these histological images are still fairly naive and we found that they didn't uh, perform as well as we needed them to. 
So the way that we ended up approaching this problem is by using a deep unsupervised learning approach to extract features. This is called a convolutional autoencoder. And the idea is that you uh, put in the uh, image uh, on one end of the autoencoder uh, using a bunch of convolutional filters. You uh, come up with a bottleneck. These are 1,024 features uh, that are basically encode the image as well as possible. And then the decoder essentially rebuilds the entire image from that just those bottleneck features. And the idea is that these filters, the parameters for these filters are learned by minimizing the L2 distance between the original, uh, the original slice of the sample and the output uh, from the decoder. I should say this work was published this year, um, uh, fairly recently in, in, in um, uh, Nature Communications. So I'll say it's a little bit more complicated than that. We actually take patches of uh, each of these images and run them all through this autoencoder and actually take the uh, empirical mean of the uh, bottleneck at the end of it. And we explain all this in the paper. I, I highly recommend for details going to that paper because I'm gonna skim over a lot of them. Um, then what we do uh, is because we have matched samples, so for every slice of tissue, again, they took one, well, they have two slices of each tissue, one of them went to the pathology image, uh, and one of them went to gene expression, this is bulk uh, RNA sequencing. Uh, and so here we have bulk RNA sequencing in Y1 and gene, ex and, and uh, sorry, and, um, uh, and the image features uh, for that same sort of matched sample in Y2. And we have this across, let's say, approximately 500 samples uh, and different dimensions uh, of the feature space for uh, the gene expression and the image features as well. So what we do is we use lambda 1 and lambda 2 to project uh, both of these different feature spaces down to the same x. So here are these features, uh, that this, uh, these factors are just the exact same x matrix, but the feature, uh, the, the projection, the weights uh, are going to be different. We also include sparsity in these weights. Uh, so that now when we think of a single component, we can talk about the set of image features and the set of genes that appear to co-vary uh, jointly in this set of, um, in this set of uh, samples that we have in the images and the paired gene expression. Uh, so we can now find gene expression and image features that appear to co-vary, that appear to be correlated. So uh, we actually first applied this to uh, this uh, TCGA data set, the brain lower grade glioma data set, which is an invasive uh, brain tumor. Um, after all is said and done, we ended up having about 400 matched um, uh, RNA sequencing samples and uh, histological images. Here are three examples. If you happen to be a pathologist, you'll notice that actually these uh, samples are not of that high quality. Um, they look like they have uh, decayed pretty substantially. Uh, so something to keep in mind as we uh, look, at the, uh, look at the results. Um, so the first component that we found, uh, let me orient you to what you're looking at here. Um, these are three uh, images that appeared on one extreme of uh, the component, the X um, uh, vector representing this component. And here are three images that appeared on the other extreme of this um, uh, X uh, factor. <coughs> and by pulling out uh, the gene expression, uh, the go terms uh, that are associated with the genes that had non-zero weights for this particular component, we can see what the difference is effectively between these two sets of samples. So here we're going to see genes uh, that have uh, high uh, go terms uh, for synaptic transmission, synaptic signaling, transsynaptic signaling, and cell-cell signaling. Whereas here we see actually that expression of those genes is much lower. Um, and I went to a pathologist to try and understand this result, uh, and his argument was that these samples on the left uh, are ones that uh, appear to be healthier, appear to um, be uh, less necrotic, less dead, uh, whereas the ones over here are more dead. And he also noted that in brain, often the axons that create these synapses uh, are the ones that decay the fastest um, in these tissues. And so what's actually happening here is we're picking up um, uh, the lack of uh, synapses, the decay from the synapses in the uh, poorer quality, older, uh, more dead tissue. Uh, whereas uh, we're contrasting it to the live tissue or the more closer to live tissue here. Um, we also looked at uh, this particular example of a component that I particularly like. Um, so here's one extreme and here's the other extreme of the images. And when we pulled out the, um, the, the go terms for the genes that were non-zero in this component, we see immune response, immune system process, defense response. And we were wondering, 
what this really means, what it looks like is that these three images uh, are brain tissues that are heavily infused with immune cells, whereas these three images are brain tissues that uh, are less heavily infused by immune cells. So here essentially we're using uh, these components to quantify um, uh, cell type heterogeneity, uh, which I think is uh, pretty special. And then we can interpret the cell type heterogeneity by looking at the genes that are expressed uniquely in a subset, a subtype of cell, in this case, immune cells. Uh, so we also applied this, uh, these uh, ideas to the uh, GTAX consortium V6 data. We've applied it to V8 data, but I'm not quite ready to show all those results yet. Um, this data set had about uh, 552 individuals, uh, uh, 7,000 samples that includes RNA sequencing, bulk RNA sequencing, and the imaging. It's about two thirds male and one third female, and it includes 44 different uh, tissues here, including uh, at least 14 brain tissues, which is a really special aspect of this data set. Um, so uh, as I sort of hinted at, we have about 2,000 histological images and about uh, almost 500 participants. Uh, and we have approximately 20,000 genes using RNA sequencing. Here's sort of three canonical uh, images that we have from this data set that look exactly like they should. Here's um, skeletal muscle, heart left ventricle, which is uh, myocardiocytes, and then uh, cerebral cortex, which you can see the, the canonical folds of the brain. Uh, so when we pushed um, all of these images through our, very, our, our convolutional autoencoder, and then we just perform TSNI on the uh, representation of them, we see that actually uh, TSNI and the features generally don't necessarily capture um, the tissue type that well, except for skeletal muscle. So this is a big cluster of skeletal muscle over here. Uh, whereas if we see, look at these uh, sort of watercolor uh, examples, these are all thyroid. And we see that they don't cluster very nicely in this TSNI representation at all. We see even one over here. Um, so in general, uh, these, uh, these features don't necessarily capture cell type that well. Um, so as we noted, they do capture muscle well. So the first component that we see in this factor analysis, in, in the CCA analysis, is uh, cells that, or sorry, uh, genes that differentiate cell, uh, muscle cells from everything else. Uh, so these are contractile fibers, uh, muscle system process, contraction, actin binding, all which are uniquely found in, uh, in, in skeletal muscle. Whereas here's the sort of riffraff, the, the rest of the, the different types of tissues um, that have low expression of these particular genes. Um, and so we see if we just look across a bunch of different tissue types and across the genes that are non-zero in this component, that these uh, are, are particularly lit up in skeletal muscle, uh, in, in different examples of skeletal muscle across GTEx. So one thing that we might want to try to sort of extend this, given the special, uh, the uniqueness of the uh, GTEx data set, is to ask the question about genetic variation and whether it influences cellular morphology. So the idea here is to uh, look at uh, genotype data, uh, and we have genotype data for all of the samples in GTEx. And here's an example of uh, one genotype, and here's the alternative genotype. And it's possible that these uh, differences in genotype create differences in uh, RNA and then protein abundance levels of a particular protein. Um, and that those differences in abundance actually affect cellular morphology. And we were curious to see if using the dimension reduction uh, that we have developed, whether we could actually identify any of these, uh, we're calling uh, image morphology QTLs. Uh, and the answer is yes. So we looked at this in a, in a, a, in a tissue specific way, and we found a, a really nice example in colon. Uh, where the genotype is on the x-axis here. There are zero, one, and two copies of this genotype minor allele. Uh, and on the y-axis is going to be a specific image feature value. And you can see that these genotypes really nicely differentiate uh, the, um, the, the, this, these different samples along this feature value. And here's the exact same image, actually the exact same data, but the thumbnails of each of the images are plotted there. Sort of hard to see what's going on, but I can uh, zoom in for you. Uh, so here are two examples of, um, of the images uh, where the image feature is high. Uh, talking with a pathologist, this appears to represent inflamed colons, um, whereas the ones on the bottom represent uh, normal colons, colons without inflammation. And I should say that we actually looked at this as mediated, uh, these, this association between the genotype and gene expression 
as mediated through LDHD, which is uh, a gene uh, that uh, is uh, expressed in the colon. And it turns out that it is expressed in high amounts in the healthy colons and low amounts uh, in the inflamed colons. Indeed, when we went to protein atlas, uh, the human protein atlas, we see that um, when you have high expression of this gene, your survival rate for colorectal cancer is much higher, uh, presumably because it helps with inflammation, whereas low uh, rates of LDHD in, um, uh, in the colon actually has worse survival rates over, over a few years. This is over 12 years. Um, so uh, in conclusion, uh, for this particular example, uh, image CCA appears to identify shared variation among image features and bulk RNA sequencing. Uh, and then CCA plus the analysis and the labeling, we did this manually, of course, uh, of each component really led to uh, us uh, to be able to generate a bunch of different hypotheses about the relationship between a genotype, gene expression, and cellular morphology. Um, and as far as I know, we're pretty much the first approach uh, to identify reproducible uh, morphological QTLs. Um, we originally tried this with univariate regression, but it was incredibly difficult to control for ischemic time um, and basically um, other, other confounding factors that came uh, with the image analysis. Uh, so we ended up building this uh, CCA approach uh, to sort of get rid of all of those uh, troubles and, and uh, explicitly model all of the confounders. Uh, that lead, led to gene expression variation. So there's a lot of ongoing work in this space, not just in my group, but in other groups. Um, so with single cell RNA sequencing technology, single cell ataxy or other data modality, we can start including those, uh, uh, those different data modalities into, um, uh, into the CCA type model uh, and associate them with, um, uh, with sort of matched or unmatched actually, um, uh, uh, different pathology images or different imaging type data. Uh, we can also consider something like a telescoping CCA. So when you think about uh, single cell RNA sequencing plus genotype data, there's hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of cells that actually have the same genotype for a particular individual. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, but we can consider actually doing this telescoping version so we can actually uh, uh, find these associations uh, with different dimensions of the feature space, of the sample space actually. Um, we can also think about more interpretable approaches to uh, image feature extraction since the CCA, or C, sorry, the um, uh, convolutional autoencoder didn't necessarily give us uh, interpretable features. And we've tried that uh, in a bunch of uh, subsequent uh, work uh, uh, research papers that we have. So one thing I wanted to uh, throw out there for all of the um, uh, trainees that are watching is that this wasn't a linear process. I'll say actually that this paper started in fall 2014 um, in a class that I taught. And I'm not gonna read through all of this, but I wanted to give you an idea that this is a winding road um, and it's never a linear process to get from uh, the original ideas to the actual uh, uh, you know, PDF appearing in Nature Your Comms. Um, but uh, uh, don't, uh, don't worry if you get a few desk rejects, for example, consult with as many people as you can and get criticism and uh, keep on pushing and you can get it done. Okay, so um, uh, the next example that I wanted to tell you about is actually a paper that I believe came out today in uh, PNAS. Uh, it's called the Cellular Point Project Process and it's used to deconvolve cell signaling in spatiotemporal data. Um, so here is a movie and I'm hopeful, uh, I was afraid it wasn't going to work. So I'm going to uh, pause this uh, video for a second and show you, um, whoops show you on my screen what this looks like. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Let's see if I can pull this. Oh, there we go. Um, oh no, I need to move this. I can get this done. All right, so hopefully you should be able to see that. So uh, when I play this, um, what you're seeing here is, I can just loop it. What you're seeing here is canine kidney cells and it's a plate of them, uh, ex vivo. Uh, and my collaborator, Jared Tocher and his students uh, basically at the beginning of this time series um, uh, made a deep wound uh, in the time series. Uh, and then uh, they also labeled uh, ERK, uh, which is a signaling protein uh, with a GFP. So all of the green dots in here are cells that are pulsing with ERK. And all the blue dots are cells that are not uh, pulsing ERK at this moment. So if you look at this uh, image a thousand times, which I probably have at this point, you'll see a number of things, which is first of all, the cells are moving and ERK is pulsing uh, at a really 
cool way. Um, but there are also clusters of ERK pulsing. So it does appear that ERK uh, uh, signaling, pulsing in one cell actually influences ERK pulsing in nearby cells. But you'll also see a spatial component to it across the larger space where right near the uh, wound, you'll see that there's actually low ERK pulsing. It's a lot of blue over here. So these cells appear to be pretty focused on uh, dealing with the wound, healing the wound, whereas there's a high level of ERK pulsing inside the wound frontier. Uh, and so motivated by uh, staring at this video a thousand times, um, which is just so much fun, actually, um, we uh, started building the following, um, the following analysis. Um, let me get back here. Perfect. OK. Um, so, uh, so the idea here is that um, we wanted to develop a model to understand how cells talk to each other, to basically look at this, uh, be able to understand and quantify what cell signaling looked like in a movie like you just saw. Uh, and so the idea behind the model that we ended up using, which is called a Hawks process, um, is it's, it's referred to as a self-exciting point process. And the idea here is that we're going to quantitatively uh, measure the rate or quantitatively estimate the rate uh, lambda for each of pulsing in each of these three cells. So here's lambda one, which is the rate of pulsing of ERK in this cell number one. Uh, lambda two is for cell two and lambda three is for cell three over here. And the idea again is that um, we have maybe a pulse one um, in cell one. Uh, this is going to increase the probability that the same cell pulses ERK again but it's also going to increase the, the rate of pulsing in cell number two because they're local to each other. Uh, it's not local to cell three as local as it is to cell two. So it won't necessarily, pulse one doesn't necessarily affect the rate of pulsing of pulse, uh, cell three. But you can see that when uh, cell two pulses, uh, it actually impacts both cell one and cell three. And you can sort of play this out. Uh, and on the y-axis of each of these, uh, uh, each of these plots is gonna be the, the rate of uh, pulsing uh, for each of these cells across time, which is on the x-axis. So that was kind of our motivation. Um, and really what we wanted to do was deconvolve these three different sources of pulsing. So there's gonna be one uh, type of pulsing, which is just a spontaneous rate. So how often does a cell completely in isolation just decide to pulse ERK? Um, that's gonna be referred to as mu. And here's the low and the high uh, signal uh, pulsing rate. We can also think about uh, self-excitation. So when a specific cell, again in isolation, pulses, um, how does that affect uh, ERK being uh, uh, expressed again, pulsing again in that same cell across time? Uh, so that's referred to as self-excitation. Uh, and the third source of pulsing that we wanted to deconvolve is uh, the high, um, uh, uh, the high cell cell or cell cell coupling. So when two cells are nearby each other in space, how often is it the, is it the case that uh, this cell pulsing will influence the rate of pulsing in a nearby cell? Uh, and again, our goal was to deconvolve these three different sources of pulsing uh, in these data. So what we did was we built a cellular Hawks process. Uh, this is the actual definition of the Hawks process. Um, so first we started out with a generic point process. And the idea here is to describe the rate of pulsing at time t, which is lambda t, um, as just the limit as delta t goes to zero of the expected value uh, of the count uh, of events that happen. And those are each of the pulses between time t and time t plus delta t, given the number of pulses that have happened in the past over uh, uh, delta t. Um, it turns out that for a Poisson process, a, a simple process, this rate is uniform. So we can consider this mu again as our sort of background rate of pulsing, uh, our base rate of pulsing. Uh, but for a Hawks process, we're going to start considering both self-exciting and the neighbor influences on this particular cell. So here we're going to define a rate uh, of pulsing for a particular cell as um, mu plus um, essentially the, the influence of both self when this is a j j referring to the same cell um, and um, the influence of the neighbors. This actually goes across all k cells in the image. Uh, so that's going to be described by a j k where j and k are not equal. Uh, and this looks complicated, but it's actually not. It's just a log normal kernel. Um, so it's just describing the essentially rate of uh, decay um, for uh, the relationship both across distance and across time uh, of each of the cells. Um, so in this model, there is going to end up being five relevant parameters, mu, 
uh, AJK, BJK, and A self and B self. And so we actually estimate each of those. Um, so to give you an idea of the interpretation here, mu is exactly what we said before. This is going to represent the spontaneous pulsing rate. Uh, a self, so AJJ, is going to represent self excitation rate um, or influence. And uh, AJK, where J and K are not equal, is going to represent the uh, a cell coupling, the, the neighboring cell influence. Um, so again, let's look at this, uh, this video. I won't actually play it because it's not playing, I think, but uh, let's look at this video um, and think about um, and, and apply our model to it. And I should add that um, we actually um, process all of this data using existing software. Um, so yeah, we use specialized uh, software to segment the cells, pull each of the pulsing events and the spatial coordinates uh, from, uh, from these movie data sets. So what we see here um, is that uh, cell signaling changes as a function of distance from the wound. This is what we saw in the movie anyway. Uh, so it's nice that our, uh, our model pulls this out. So here's the base rate. And uh, DMSO is just our control buffer that we put on these cells. So we expose them to just you know, essentially saline solution. Um, and this is going to be the base rate. Um, and the higher it is, the more base pulsing there is. And here's the spatial bin. So this is our wound, and this is how far away each of these cells are from, or each of these bins of cells are from that wound over here. Uh, and you can see that in, in the context of our control data set, um, we see very low uh, a base rate of pulsing right near the wound, but then it spikes as we go in, in from the wound frontier, uh, and then it sort of goes down a little bit. And the, um, the idea uh, behind this sort of spike uh, near the wound frontier is that these cells are essentially recruiting um, other cells, these healthy cells out here, to help, uh, help uh, uh, heal the wound uh, like these uh, cells at the frontier are, are doing already. Um, but what was unknown before we actually used our model is that when we expose these cells to um, these two different um, interventions, both of these reduce cell signaling. But we also find that they actually also reduce base rate, which was unknown before this. Um, so you can see for both CAPI-1 and uh, this uh, drug that I'm probably going to screw up the pronunciation so I won't try, um, uh, you can see that actually the base rate mu is uh, suppressed for both of them, which again was unknown before we uh, were able to use this model. Uh, what we do see, what we can confirm, is that cell signaling um, uh, actually changes as well. So this is going to be A, J, K. Uh, this is going to be the cell signaling between uh, pairs of cells. Oops. Um, and here we see, again, for our control, uh, we see uh, definite repression of uh, uh, this signaling uh, near the wound. Uh, and then it peaks um, between the wound, wound frontier and sort of the healthy normal cells. Uh, but we certainly see uh, repression of cell signaling uh, as we uh, expose these cells to uh, these two uh, signaling repressive drugs. Um, and you can see this, there's actually a, a huge spatial pattern that is uh, pretty well preserved across the different, um, across the different uh, experiments and different exposures, uh, which is really nice to see. Um, I can say we, we extended this model actually to multiple channels. And the experiment that we did here that I don't, um, don't have a movie of is that we engineered, or we being Jared Tocher's lab, engineered some cells to express GFP uh, for FOSS expression and KTR for ERK expression in two different channels. Uh, and what we did here was apply our model uh, to estimate um, this, these A parameters, these signaling parameters, uh, thinking about um, a KTR to GFP um, uh, influence versus GFP to KTR influence or signaling, I guess I should say. Uh, and this ratio is going to tell us essentially uh, whether ERK directionally affects FOS transcription in nearby cells. Uh, and so we find that in both gross, growth and starved conditions, we see indeed a, a you know, two and a half, uh, give or take, ratio uh, of KTR to GFP um, uh, versus GFP to KTR um, uh, cell signaling, which tells us that actually ERG does in a directed way affect FOS transcription, uh, which is, uh, again, was not really known before this, but here we've quantified it, I think, quite nicely in our model. Um, we see that uh, actually some of these, um, uh, some of these cell signaling uh, drugs when exposed to uh, uh, these cells um, don't actually affect uh, this particular signaling, but others do, and in fact, bring it down basically to non-existent in some cases. 
Um, so again, we can ex expand uh, this essentially network of A, this matrix A, to large numbers of uh, uh, channels uh, for different, um, uh, different types of um, proteins that are being expressed, but also we can think about different cell types um, and uh, other, other aspects uh, within the model that we've developed. Um, so thinking about the impact of uh, these ideas, these cellular point process ideas, um, so the CPP deconvolves and quantifies three different sources of cell signaling from these time series uh, movie data sets. Um, this flexibly is, extends to multiple channels and cell types uh, because it's a, you know, sort of a flexible uh, machine learning model. It also quantifies uncertainty nicely, again, because it's this, um, you know, Bayesian generative model effectively. Uh, you can see that we have the error bars on those ratios, uh, which were um, which were nicely done by by my student um, and my collaborators. Um, compared to icing models and other models that have been used to quantify cell signaling, uh, we find that the CPP actually robustly quantifies the signaling in uh, these complex data sets with actually fairly low no, low uh, amounts of data, small numbers of cells and small numbers of pulses. Um, but we have many future ideas that we're going to extend these ideas to. Um, so we'd like to actually uh, uh, build spatially varying parameters so we didn't have to just bin the cells uh, according to distance from the wound. Uh, we'd like to have a more flexible model of distance. Right now, we essentially have a cutoff. Uh, but we'd also like to account for differences and changes in cell type and size and shape and also consider cell movement. So right now we just basically track each cell in that movie and assume it hasn't moved. Whereas in reality, of course, the cells are moving and the distances between the cells are changing. Uh, and that's sort of part of the story too. So there's a lot of extensions to do here. Okay, here's our here's my uh, research journey for the cellular point process. And um, I, I should say it started much more recently, but was published nearly at the same time. So this started with a research meeting between me and Jared Tocher and Archit Burnham, my student in, uh, in April, 2019, uh, which was hysterical because Archit said, none of the ideas that we talked about as PIs actually ended up coming out in the paper. So Archit and um, uh, his uh, friend and collaborator, Sidhu, who's in the uh, Tocher lab, uh, ended up actually creating the entire basis of this work by looking at these videos a thousand times like I did. Um, uh, these uh, fluorescence movies were available through collaborations in the Tocher lab. Uh, I should say we tried many, many, many different um, uh, uh, generative models and it took a while to find the right one. Um, it was also just rejected at Nature Methods, like pretty much all of my papers and uh, cell systems. Uh, but then we ended up actually revising it, making it more of a statistics paper and sending it to PNAS, where it's pretty quickly uh, accepted and is in, in press today, which I'm very excited about. And meanwhile, Archid and Sidhu um, have both defended their thesis and are now off uh, living their best lives. <laughs> Okay, um, example three is sort of future work. Um, it is future work. So I can't uh, give you anything definitive on this, except to say that we have some cool results and I wanted to show them to you. Uh, but it's sort of an example of other, other ways we can um, build models uh, that help us think about um, these patterns in, in these uh, spatial data sets. Uh, and so I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. And this is a joint work with uh, my postdoc, uh, Will Towns. So uh, our goal was to build uh, non-negative matrix factorization tools to be able to identify patterns of expression. Uh, and it was really motivated um, by the ideas here. So let's just think about very simple simulations where all of our samples are gonna be in two dimensions and they're gonna be some combination, some non-negative combination of each of these four patterns up here, okay? So we're gonna generate a whole bunch of samples that are combinations of these four patterns uh, and um, this is going to be our ground truth. Um, so we applied uh, to these uh, to these simulated examples principal components analysis, which makes Gaussian assumptions. Uh, and you can see that um, PCA was able to find uh, the four different patterns pretty easily, but not uniquely. Uh, they're they're not deconvolved. They're sort of all mushed together in these sort of eigen samples, if you will. Um, when we applied non-negative matrix factorization, we see unique uh, patterns, each of these four patterns being pulled out uniquely uh, from this sampling data set, despite the fact that the images look more like this. Um, so this is kind of what we wanted to go, to, go uh, towards in uh, some of the imaging data that we're seeing, that the uh, genomic imaging data that we're seeing. Um, and so we actually tried this exact same uh, simulation data set with the same ground truth. 
uh, we tried this with two, um, or with an existing method, Mephisto, uh, which was developed um, uh, in Ali Stiegel's lab uh, and, and uh, put up on uh, our bioarchive uh, last year in, in 2020, Velton et al. I uh, highly recommend this paper. This really inspired a lot of this work. Um, we see that using the Gaussian assumptions in Mephisto, we see that just like PCA uh, on these additive uh, samples, um, we see that there's sort of eigen patterns, but nothing deconvolved uh, nicely. Um, so we basically took Mephisto and um, sort of reworked their model to build it, what we're calling a non-negative process factorization model. And again, in these additive data, uh, we see that um, it pulls out the four different uh, types of uh, patterns very nicely and deconvolves them easily. Um, I should say that these results look a lot like the additive uh, models, uh, principal components analysis and, and non-negative uh, matrix factorization. Um, that's because, of course, it's additive uh, ground truth. Uh, our samples were all additive. So we didn't expect that to do too much better, but we did use it as a motivation. Um, so I'll tell you what the model looked like briefly. Um, so uh, here are y, i, j variables are just going to be the expression of marker j um, for the i uh, cell. Uh, the uh, spatial components are just going to be x, i, where we're assuming a cell um, has a single component and all uh, genes slash proteins that are expressed in that cell um, have the same coordinate system. Uh, then L is going to be the number, the total number of components in our model. Uh, here, new is going to account for the total reads. We don't actually use that heavily right now. Uh, and our W matrix, W, I, L, is going to be our non-negative loading matrix. All of these values are, are greater or equal to zero. And then we consider uh, I equals one to N cells. Um, so here, I should say we used a matern 3-2 kernel uh, to uh, uh, build this uh, kernel here. Actually, let me first tell you what the model is. So we're assuming that the y, i, j, each of these uh, expression reads um, were, are pulled from a Poisson distribution uh, with this particular rate parameter. So nu uh, times lambda for i, j for this cell in this gene. Um, uh, this rate parameter is actually gonna be the linear combination over all of our latent variables of our loadings matrix and the exponentiated factors. The reason we exponentiated the factors um, is uh, to make sure that they were non-negative. And then here is the um, uh, Gaussian process. This is going to be essentially uh, describing the relationship of rates among neighboring cells, where again, we compose um, this uh, covariance matrix. Uh, essentially, we enforce the relationship between neighboring cells using this kernel that we have. Uh, and again, we used a matern 3-2 kernel uh, to impose this relationship um, on, on the neighboring cells by location. Okay, so the, the NPF model uh, allows us to capture spatial latent components through its own Gaussian process. So each of the uh, spatial latent components L has its own Gaussian process that we learn the uh, parameters for. Uh, it turns out uh, we can run inference in this model with variational inference. We use inducing points when N, the number of cells is too large, but actually we also just run it uh, uh, all, on all the cells without inducing points when there is not too many cells. Um, so I'll give you a taste of what we're seeing here. So um, when we run non-negative process factorization applied to this mouse brain data, which is uh, this beautiful 10x uh, genomics mouse brain data set that we have. Here, what I'm showing you is just nine genes and uh, where they're expressed in this particular sample. Uh, so you can see here's the sample. This is actually a quite a, a large view uh, of a mouse brain. Um, and then uh, where the lighter values are here are, are where, where each of these genes uh, and the label are expressed in this two-dimensional space. Um, so we apply non-negative matrix factors or process factorization, sorry, uh, to this mouse brain data. We include 12 spatial components. So again, these are gonna be spatially aware components. Um, and again, the way we reinforce that is through the, uh, the Gaussian process kernel function. Um, and so what you see here um, is uh, each of those components, um, we just actually plot uh, the two dimensional uh, components themselves. Um, and you see that this nicely deconvolves um, all of the different regions of the brain. So as a really uh, elegant example, I think, here's an, a, a, a component that represents the inner cortex of the brain. Whereas over here, we see an example of a component that represents just the outer cortex of the brain. And the cool part about this is given the model that we have uh, for W, for our loadings matrix, we can actually pull out um, exactly which genes are involved in each of these components. So we know where, uh, which genes are, are differentially expressed in each of these uh, components of the brain. Uh, 
Um, so to tell you about sort of where this is going, um, we see that it's, uh, NPF is able to identify spatial patterns and spatial genomic data. Uh, it turns out to scale to a large number of markers and components, and it also is able to quantify uncertainty, again, because it's a probabilistic model. Uh, versus Mephisto and other supervised methods, NPF reliably teases apart spatial patterns. Uh, the paper are going to include a bunch of different uh, additional results, including non-spatial latent components to capture cell types that aren't necessarily differentially or uh, spatially expressed or existing. <laughs> Um, we're also going to apply this model to different uh, spatial genomic data sets and thanks to everyone in the community broadly um, who's uh, allowing us to access their data. Uh, and uh, we also interpret local patterns and variation in expression directly from the model because it's a very uh, interpretable model. So uh, this is a very short research journey because it isn't quite done yet, but I wanted to say it's also none of none of these are ever uh, uh, straightforward. And I have to say we were, again, heavily influenced in a very positive way by uh, the Mephisto preprint, which we absolutely love. Um, so to summarize, um, each of these three different uh, projects that I told you about uh, basically combine a lot of the ideas, a lot of the goals that I was originally stating. Um, so we have in example one uh, is, is an example of multimodal data integration, hypothesis generation, uh, population-wide variation. Example two uh, allowed us to uh, talk about quantifying local effects in cellular neighborhoods and predicting effects of interventions. And example three is describing spatial patterns of expression and spatially aware dementia reduction. Um, along with local variation. Uh, and again, I feel like each of these uh, projects uh, nicely um, exemplify uh, our research objectives. Again, finding patterns, creating testable hypotheses, and identifying mechanisms in the genomic data. Um, and so one thing I wanted to sort of leave us with is how much more rethinking of the status quo is needed. Um, I think, again, with this additional dimension um, of, well, these additional two dimensions of space and single cells, we need to rethink things like differential expression, uh, multiple scales and resolution of the data, uh, population variation, uh, quantitative trait loci, case control studies. I mean, not even clear if we <laughs> ever got that under control with the bulk data sets, um, and experimental design, which I think is going to be super important as we move forward in this space by integrating machine learning methods tightly um, for faster experimental iterations. Um, so these are all things that I feel like we kind of need to, you know, essentially toss out what we've been doing before and rethink how we're, how we're building models for these types of data. Um, I wanted to really quickly uh, give out thank yous for the Overton Prize. First of all, um, thank you to my postdocs, grad students, and undergrads. You are just absolutely phenomenal and uh, you're a joy to work with. Uh, I love my colleagues in computational biology and I'm really sad we haven't met up, uh, but I hope we have the opportunity to soon. I want to, in particular, shout out to the two uh, people who nominated me for this award. I absolutely appreciate your support. Uh, unbelievable uh, as colleagues and friends. Um, future awardees, I want to say, uh, please seek me out if you have questions about your career, um, about any doubts about your work, anything. I, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, or if you can, uh, if you're at that stage, come do a postdoc in my group. We love to have uh, postdocs. Um, my four kids, I could thank, but honestly, they don't know what's going on yet. Um, I want to also thank the award committee. Um, thank you for acknowledging my work. I really appreciate it. I genuinely um, am, am honored to be in the set of people that have received this award. Um, I also would like to ask if maybe you would consider removing age restrictions, because uh, sometimes uh, we take a little bit of time to, to get to where we are in our research careers. Uh, but most of all, I want to go back to my, my group. This is a slightly older picture, but uh, here's all the group members labeled and the important collaborators and, of course, my uh, funding. Thank you so much. Happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Barbara, for this exciting lecture and uh, for all the data that you showed us and for setting really the path towards uh, a new exploration of biological samples. And um, now for the questions, I, I should say that I have to, uh, I don't see, I don't see the question myself, unless somebody is showing to me the questions. Can you, Diane, help? Oh, by the way, thanks so much to Diane Kovacs, our executive director, and uh, <laughs> who is helping now. But really, I don't see the questions. In so, any case, I'll ask you one, one question. 
<laughs> in the meantime, I'll ask yeah. you. So I have, I, I see a few of the questions, so I can, I can read them out loud if you'd like me to. Yeah, but yeah, but go ahead I, and answer the question first. I think that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see the question. I can't. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So either you go ahead by yourself, or if somebody wants me to moderate, I should see the question as well. Okay. In any case, may I ask you which are the uh, main, uh, I would say, uh, bottlenecks in your research. So samples, uh, Im image resolutions, or what else? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of my work uh, in the past is focused on the effects of confounders. Um, uh, and uh, I feel like that's sort of something I have under control a little bit is sort of teasing apart these uh, sources of variation in these dimension, you know, high dimensional data sets. But I have to say, I think, I mean, besides data accessibility, which is something I always dream of, the, the two things that are really important in this space are, first of all, all the pre-processing software. I've, I've basically skipped over all of that. We, we don't do work in that area. We sort of do work after all of these samples have been processed. Um, and it's absolutely critical to get that right. Um, uh, a lot of people are working on that, uh, you know, uh, Ann Carpenter, uh, David Van Valen, and their work is absolutely invaluable to be able to build on top of uh, these images using the, the analysis that they've done. So, you know, thanks to them, um, but there's obviously still more to do. We're not at 100% with any of that yet. So um, finally, I was able to reach the chat room. So okay. mm -hmm. how do you know? One question, how do you know whether the differences you see in base and cell signal rates between interventions are not the result of batch effects in the imaging data? Yeah, actually, you know, a lot of them are the result of, of batch effects in the imaging data. Um, and what we try and do is um, actually uh, label very accurately the um, those those batch effects. So to give you an example, a lot of the um, a lot of the data that we have is confounded by ischemic time, how long a particular sample has been out of the body, um, and so it has time to degrade. Uh, and so we can actually just correlate um, the uh, factors with uh, what we know about each of the samples. We have labels of ischemic time, um, and we can, uh, in essence, just get rid of each of those factors when we see a correlation with a known batch effect, or if we see cells that don't make much biological sense coming up is non-zero factors, we can also remove that component. Uh, so it's basically done by this very detailed manual labeling of each of the components. Another question, what is the reasoning behind the four patterns you choose as ground truth? You know what, we actually just pulled that from a, um, a paper uh, on um, I'm going to say it, it, it's some version of uh, the Indian buffet process, I believe, from um, uh, uh, from uh, Griffiths and Garamani, uh, maybe 20 years ago now. So it's just a, a sort of standard uh, standard set of patterns uh, from an existing simulation that seemed to work well. <laughs> We're going to try other ones overlapping. <laughs> like Thank you very much. I was wondering how did you do guys go about estimating the parameters of the OX model using the cellular point process? Yeah, Thanks. good question also. So we ended up um, using actually fairly straightforward uh, stochastic variational inference. Um, inference surprisingly was not as hard as we thought it, it would be. Um, we used, uh, again, a very simple uh, variational approximation as the model. Um, and uh, with the log normal kernel, it seemed to do very well. Yeah, uh, inference was very robust. We have examples of that in the paper, yeah. 